Hey folks, it's your boy Nathan in the booth of truth once again. And we are in the book The One and the Many by R. J. Rush Dooney. And we're in the tenth section thereof. It's blow and counter blow. The side of orthodoxy, the side of the Trinity, and the side of um, the Antichrist. Those who believe that man can be divinized and man's institutions, primarily the state, can be divinized and that we can even control heaven from earth by earth by man. Man is the determiner. So we're about to touch on Calvin on law and love. Uh, Calvin's weakness, as it were, his kryptonite. Okay, so without further ado, let us record, shall we? Calvin, one, two. Five. Calvin on law and love. We have seen how Calvin at times underrated the law, as did Luther also, and that Calvin expressed a preference for the common law of nations as against the polity of Moses. With this, without realising it, Calvin reopened the door to natural law and also to common grace, a concept he would not have recognised. The idea of common grace has become, however, the chief doctrine of modern neo-Calvinism, and the state is grounded on common grace as its sphere. Moreover, Calvin saw man as the subject of two kinds of government, an inner one, relating to eternal life, is the province of the church, the other is civil government, which relates to civil justice and the regulation of the external conduct. For this outer world, virtually all the world, Calvin rejected biblical law. The world was thus, in effect, sundered from God, and at this point given its own sovereignty and independence. But Calvin did not apply these ideas Instead, he surpassed Luther and insisted that the state must enforce both tables of the law, that the state, in short, must be Christian, not natural or neutral, a possibility he denied. Civil government, he held, must enforce God's law. For Calvin, the rule of life which God has given us is his law. At the same time, Calvin strongly emphasised the duty of love. Men are so used to reviling Calvin for his belief in predestination that they fail to notice the very heavy emphasis he placed on loving and doing good to all men. Thus Calvin wrote, Whoever therefore is presented to you that needs your kind offices, you have no reason to refuse him your assistance. Say that he is a stranger, yet the Lord has impressed on him a character which ought to be familiar to you, for which reason he forbids you to despise your own flesh. Isaiah 60, 55. Isaiah 50. Isaiah 58, 3. Say that he is contemptible and worthless, but the Lord shows him to be one whom he has deigned to grace with his own image. Say that you are obliged to him for no services, but God has made him, as it were, his substitute, to whom you acknowledge yourself to be under obligations for numerous and important benefits. Say that he is unworthy of your making the smallest exertion on his account, but the image of God by which... by which he is recommended to you, deserves your surrender of yourself and all that you possess. If he not only has deserved no favour, but, on the contrary, has provoked you with injuries and insults, even this is no just reason why you should cease to embrace him with your affection and to perform to him the offices of love. Had he deserved, you will say, very different treatment from me, but what has the Lord deserved? who, when he commands you to forgive men all their offences against you, certainly intends that they should be charged to himself. This is the only way of attaining that which is not only difficult, but are...
but utterly repugnant to the nature of man to love them who hate us. Matthew 5.44 To requite injuries with kindnesses and to return blessings for curses. Luke 7, 3 and 4 We should remember that we must not reflect on the wickedness of men, but contemplate the divine image in them, which, concealing and obliterating their faults, by its beauty and dignity allures us to embrace them in the arms of our love. This is virtually a doctrine of unconditional love. It has a vein of antinomianism in it. It is close to the position of modern liberals who believe in salvation by love. This undue and disproportionate emphasis on love appears at times in Calvin. Combined with the inconsistent attitude of law, it gave ground for the development of a liberalism out of Calvin. On the other hand... This is so interesting. Wow. On the one hand, some English and American Puritans used one element of Calvinism to develop a concept of society grounded on God's sovereignty and biblical law. On the other hand, however hopelessly in error Fairchild's theology is, his point is well taken that Calvinism in England also led to sentimentalism and a naturalistic humanism. Oh my goodness. Oh wow. Wow, 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 I'm wowed. Wow. I did not see that coming. Shoo wee. I tell you what, boss. Six, Richard Hooker. And England had little to counteract this trend, since the semi-official position of the Church of England came to be Erastian, Arminian, and heretical. Richard Hooker, fifteen fifty-three to sixteen hundred, was clearly subordination subordinationist. Was clearly subordinationist. was clearly subordinationist and Arian in his Christology. Hooker wrote, Seeing therefore the Father alone is originally that deity which Christ originally is not, for Christ is God by being of God, light by issuing out of light, it followeth hereupon that whatsoever Christ hath common unto him with his heavenly Father, the same of necessity must be given him, but naturally and eternally given, not bestowed by way of benevolence and favour, as the other gifts both are. And therefore, where the fathers give it out for a rule, that whatsoever Christ is said in Scripture to have received, the same we ought to apply only to the manhood of Christ. Their assertion is true of all things which Christ hath received by grace, but to that which he hath received of the Father, by eternal nativity or birth, it reacheth not. However much Hooker tried, you know, however much Hooker, you know, you know, you know, however much Hooker tried to claim the church fathers for his position, it was clearly heresy. Hooker, while trying to emphasize grace as the ground of man's deification in Christ, still deified Chalcedon to, ah, ha, ha, sorry, I wondered. still defied Chalcedon to insist that in Christ, man is really made God. The union, therefore, of the flesh with deity is to that flesh a gift of principal grace and favour, for, by virtue of this grace, man is really made God, a creature is exalted above the dignity of all creatures, and hath all creatures also under it. When challenged by a Calvinist to prove how his position differed from that of Arius, Hooker's answer was, The Godhead of the Father and of the Son is no way denied, but granted to be the same. 
The only thing denied is that the person of the Son hath deity or Godhead in such sorts as the Father hath it. Having introduced man into the Godhead, Hooker plainly made man God's associate in the government of all things. Thus, the British monarchy now had indeed a divine right of amazing dimensions, as Hooker stated the doctrine of man's divinity. We have seen the enemy, and it is us, not the flaming Luminati. Sick. Finally, Sith gods hath defeated. <laughs> Finally, Sith God hath deified our nature, though not by turning it into himself, yet by making it his own inseparable habitation, we cannot now conceive how God should, without man, either exercise divine power or receive the glory of divine praise. For man is in both an associative deity. It is not surprising that the British monarchs loved their Mr. Hooker. Hooker introduced man into the Godhead, Subordinated Prichards. What a tosser. Oh, how I hate his influence. This is what enslaved us. This is what broke our backs. Wow. It all becomes clear. Right, I'm having some worrying flickers come across the old um, ear plods. Hmm. Not liking that. What do I have to do? Two. Got some kind of an orca wheel as well. Or kind of fish. Maybe I'm Aquaman. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's the problem. I'm just hearing aquatic life forms. Subordinated British subjects firmly to an absolute monarch on religious grounds and saw the monarchy and the English church state as a divine order. The monarch, as head of the church as well as head of the state, had a vast power over the lives of his subjects. Had not the Puritan Commonwealth altered the course of the monarchy, England's lots would have been a fearful one. The divine one and many had been denied in favour of a divine human order. Hooker, no less than Loyola, represented a form of counter-reformation. If that doesn't boil your blood as a British subject, then nothing there, nothing should. We are chasing flipping Illuminati. Illuminati. It's false doctrine, that's what it is. Making slaves of us. In a very real way, even to this day. And the same muck goes on. Keep your distance, so distance. Go by home, 13. Sick. Wow, that's, that's a mind blow. Chapter 11. Utopia. The New City of Man 1. Humanism and Utopia The Renaissance, the Enlightenment, Romanticism and every other movement of the modern mind have one common characteristic. Anti-Christianity I wanted to leave a uh, dramatic pause there. Hope you like that. See, speedy, speedy, speedy. I am such a drama. I am drama. I personify drama. San, um, uh, let me see. What language is that? It's got to be Spanish, hasn't it? English. Okay, yeah, well, it's going to be Spanish, isn't it? It's Spanish. Mm. 
Yeah, of course it's Santiana. Uh, Santiana observed to early. See if this is coming through or not. Oh no. Oh no, 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 no. I think I'm gonna have to turn off the auto focus the autofocus. I think that's it. I think that's the way. Ah, oh, shoot, no. Uh, okay, okay, here we go. Shoo. Thank goodness for that. Oh, silence, sweet silence. That's not going to cut it, though, if it... Uh... Oh, boy. Oh, dear. Yeah, I think that's it. I'm going to have to just pause that and uh, turn off the autofocus. Yes. Uh, I don't know, guys. Santiana. Santiana. No, 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 no. This is not going to do. Oh, shoot. Hold on, folks. We got, a, uh, got to the bottom of the problem. Screen sort of out. Hold on there. All right, folks. The problem was the autofocus. Uh, the autofocus was uh, the servo motor for the autofocus in the SLR camera um, was making <laughs> noises. <laughs> and um, that wasn't good. So it's now on manual focus, or as we say in French, something out of I don't know. As Santillana observed of early and later Renaissance figures, what came under criticism was the central dogmatic complex built around original sin, inherited corruption, and divine atonements. The humanism which had saturated the Church manifested itself in numerous ways. When Nicholas of Cusa, born 1401, dreamed of reconciling Christianity with Mohammedanism, dreamed of reconciling Christianity with Mohammedanism, he was simply applying the logic of the age. Paracelsus, 1493-1541, saw a great becoming unfolding itself in man. As Santiano wrote, Santiana, Santiano. What I mean, a crazy man. As Santiana wrote, the religious emotion of Paracelsus centers on growth and delicate unfolding from the womb of time. He teaches respect for the divinely appointed moments, for the hour of God that the physician alchemist alone can discern. It is only in such a scheme, on the other hand, that things can be conceived as really independent beings having their reason and their principle of growth in themselves. Gone is the neat hierarchy of intelligence. <clears throat> Gone is the hierarchy of intelligible causes ending up in the already achieved design in the mind of the unmoved mover. There is here a true becoming, and also protein and me protein and also this is this is important for new age medicine and also protein metamorphosis in the great chain of being god and man are mystically equivalent i under god in his office god under me in mine 
This might sound like satanic pride, but it is a mystical intuition which is to be more strongly and paradoxically expressed by later Angelus Silesius in many of his doggered couplets. Doggered, oh, doggered. Dogger old couplet. This is rubbish. More strongly and paradoxically expressed later by Angelus Silesius in many of his doggerel couplets. I know that without me God could not live a second. Turned if I were to nothing, he'd give up the ghost in despair. Basic to the Renaissance perspective was the concept of a finite God, limited and non-determinative in nature. The corollary of this premise was a belief in an infinite universe. As Giordani Bruno, Giordani Bruno, as Giordano Bruno, 1548 to 1600, wrote, I hold the universe as Giordano. I'm sorry, we're just having some difficulty here getting it all together. Ay, ay, ay. I hold the universe to be infinite as being the effect of infinite divine power and goodness of which any finite world would have been unworthy. The reference to infinite divine power met the requirement of logic and science. The infinite universe was the product of an infinite divine power, a source or cause commensurate with its effect. But beyond this formal presence, the divine power had no role. With some, it was absorbed into its effect. With others, as with later deism, it remained as a now obsolete cause. An infinite universe means that man, the crown of the universe, is infinite also. Renaissance man saw himself as a new god in process of becoming. Chapman's Bussy d'Ambois Bussy Um, there was some weird pronunciation thing with this, as I remember. Dombois, Dombois, Boussy Dombois, Boussy Dombois. <clears throat> Chapman's Boussy Dombois felt shock at the realization that he could die and was dying. Is my body then but penetrable flesh, and must my mind follow my blood? Can my divine part add no aid to the earthly in extremity? Ay, ay, ay. In any other era, for a man to express amazement at his mortality would be ridiculous. In this Renaissance play, it is thoroughly credible and in keeping with the temper of the day. The Boussy d'Ambois type man of the Renaissance has been accorded with Boussy d'Ambois. Boussy. Boussy. Bou, bou, bou. This is the. The Boussy d'Ambois type man of the Renaissance has been accorded the veneration his philosophy called for. His genius has been the subject of adulation and his egoism has been taken at face value. A telling example of this is the pathetic and... <clears throat> oh yeah, come on, bring it on. Mm -hmm, bring it on. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> nice, come on. Slab him. A telling example of this is the pathetic and impotent figure of Leonardo da Vinci. A chronic dabbler and procrastinator, Leonardo found it difficult to finish anything. His notes occasionally record good observations, his jottings of the comments of wiser men. His 
his jottings of the comments of wiser men, but he was unable to bring these gleamings to focus. His one area of real ability was painting, or more accurately, drawing, but here his total production was limited and haunted by the spectre of his weakness and impotence. But because of his singular avoidance of any personal religious expression, this man has been especially highly esteemed, although amusingly the experts find it difficult to establish what was great about him. But Renaissance man being by self-definition a species of divinity, it was impossible to regard his actions as folly. What had been folly was now tragedy. The dramatic concern for tragedy, most notable in England, is a telling illustration of this fact. Chapman's Bussy d'Ambois is one of many examples, more explicit than most. For a man's divine part to follow his blood into death or disgrace was tragedy now, not sin or folly. The Renaissance also planted the seeds of Romanticism. If a man is a god, then his loves must be godlike. As a result, the Renaissance poets converted his love into a goddess, the divine Laura, Cynthia, or Jean. That's Michelangelo. I don't know how to pronounce it. That's just, that's just pizzas talking. Nothing to do with Italiano. Michelangelo. 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 Yeah, it's better that way, I think. Michelangelo. Thus, Michelangelo could declare, The power of one fair face spurs me to heaven. In his sonnets, and of his love-filled thinking, he could add, My conceptions high become divine. My conceptions high become divine. I'm such a good guy. My conceptions high become divine. The woman he called Fair Lady proud and heavenly, a description made necessary by his own self-exaltation, for how can a man shot through with Neoplatonist divinity love anything other than a woman who is heavenly or divine? Later, Shelley and Byron were to call every slut they took up with a god. Bring it on, come on! Shelley and Byron were to call every slut they took up with a goddess, until they left her, when she became a witch. A witch, after all, represents a kind of supernatural power also. Shakespeare, in his sonnets, equates his love's fever, and there are indications that both a man and a woman were the objects of his love, with a religious experience which lights up his life and makes him rich. Sonnets 29, 30, 66, 106 and others reveal this plainly. Another aspect of man's new quote-unquote divinity was utopianism. Christian orthodoxy produces no utopian dreams or plans. In God's law word, the believer already has God's purposes for the future declared, and the way thereto, faith and God's law word are plainly set forth. The believer moves towards God's predestined future with confidence. But the new God, man, must create his own decree and predestine his own future, and, as a result, he must draw up plans for a utopia. Utopianism is thus a renunciation of God's sovereignty and eternal decree in favour of a new God, man, and a new decree, man's plan. The new city of man is set forth, and the power is then sought to institute this decree. What a freaking bunch of weirdos, weirdos, blah, 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 blah. That was pretty inconsistent on my part. Okay, Thomas More. You want more? You got more. Yeah, Thomas More. I'm going to tell you, he got something said going on here. Plus the corner. Come on now, Thomas More. Get some of that utopia, more. I tell you. Alright, let's do Thomas Moore here. Thomas, Thomas Moore. He's never a boor. 
Thomas Moon. Hi, everybody. I'm Thomas Moon. You might remember me from such uh, spectacles as Utopia. That's no place for you uh, common folk. Okay. I'm sorry. What in the time nation? Two, Thomas Moore. The term utopianism comes, of course, from Thomas Moore's ideal society. Moore was made a saint in 1935 by the Church of Rome, an ironic fact in that few saints have been more subversive towards the Church. Santiana's comment is to the point. Men like Erasmus, Quillet and Moore were first and foremost apostles of culture, the reformers of the educational system and the founders of the modern English school system, of which St Paul's was the first example. Moore compared the school to the wooden horse in which were concealed armed Greeks for the destruction of barbarous Troy. Uh, honest man, at least. For the for the destruction for the destruction of barbarous Troy, but the Troy that these new Greek scholars were bent on wrecking was the stronghold of medieval learning. It is not surprising when Moore's works are examined that Roman Catholic scholars tend to discourage too close an analysis of Moore. We are told that, in a certain sense, Moore is unknowable. Moreover, we are told that men like Moore are a threat and a scandal to the single-mindedly earnest, to the true believers, and to the single-minded absolutists. This should intimidate weak-minded scholars from calling attention to Moore's inanities. Moreover, to prevent us from taking Moore at his word, we are told that his work represents subtle wit and irony as well as satire. More to the point is Van Reysen's Reysen. Take Reysen's every morning with Moosley. Help you st grow up be strong job. Strong German boy. Michelangelo. Oh, it's Dutch. No, it's not. Van Reysen's. Van Reysen. Oh, okay. Van Dreysen. Okay, cool. Wow. Got it right. Van Dreysen's. Van Dreysen's. Dreysen's. Van Dreysen's. More to the point is Van Dreysen's comments on you. Van Dreysen's. 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 Van Reichens. Van Reichens. More to the point is Van Reichens' comments on Utopia and its intense and absurd earnestness. One is amazed that the pen of Moore, noted for its spirited wit, did not drop from his hand from sheer... Did not drop from his hand. Spirited wit did not drop from his hand from sheer tediousness. Moore's utopia was also dishonest. The book is devoted to a passionate plea for the abolition of private property and the adoption of communism. The book, however, concludes with a vague disclaimer of this position. In brief, Moore wanted the liberty to preach a doctrine without any penalty, in case such should ensue. Moore's quote-unquote wit is not an evidence in his writings. It was often remarkable in his speech. His death was noble and truly heroic, but at this point we must agree with Green. His death was a heroic gesture in defence of the autonomy of conscience. Precisely, Moore died as the authentic humanist quote-unquote saint rather than as a Christian martyr. Moore's utopia is clearly anti-Christian as well as hostile to the Church. 
for Moore, the normative is derived not from God, but from nature. In Utopia, they define virtue to be a life ordered according to nature. Definibus. The phrase is derived from Cicero's De Finibus, Book 4, but the nature Moore has in mind is not the nature the Romantics later had in mind. It is nature governed, moulded, and totally controlled by statist man. Manuel's analysis is to the point. The order of happiness is within human capacity, but it is not innate. Thus, utopian man is not natural. He has been fashioned by institutions but the result is not unnatural, since the founders of Utopia realized, utilized. I know so Utopia utilized benign instincts and repressed harmful ones through education and the dictates of the law. Law. through education and the dictates of the law. In contrast to our contemporary absorption with the problem as a major source of dolorous psychic disturbance, the utopian conception of repression and vicious The utopian conception of repression envisages a process that is neither very painful nor very complicated. As a consequence, the social environment in which every newborn utopian first sees the day is uniformly pleasurable, and his whole existence will be passed in the same mild emotional climate. Tranquility is the highest good. Since only moderate pleasures are deemed to be pleasures at all, there is nothing to disrupt the order of calm felicity once it has been instituted, as long as the world endures. Moore's utopia is not even subject to the natural decay that Plato considered inevitable for his republic. Moore was thus a very modern figure. His god and nature was the state, man's recreator, preserver and providence. Moore absorbed man into a totally... Moore absorbed man into a totally eminent one, the state. Thus unity was for him the supreme virtue and serenity in that oneness. His utopia was a communist regime in which man was manipulated into place and the thought of any division in terms of religious faith was anathema. In terms of this, Moore's hatred of anything that made for separatism was intense. Himself hungry for wealth, he hated wealth in others. In his Utopia, he wrote of gold, but they make chamber pots and other common vessels for both their dining halls and homes out of gold and silver. From this passage, Lenin derived his famous idea of using gold to build public urinals in the Marxist Utopia. But what of Moore's own death for autonomy of conscience? How does this jibe with his totalitarianism? Moore like most humanistic intellectuals, saw himself as one of the elite rulers of the total order. After all, Edward Bellamy, 1850 to 1898, in Looking Backward, 1888, called for an equal annual income of $4,000 per person so that the ablest of men as well as the least received an equal amount. One exception was made by Bemily, Bemily. I like the family and the family, family. One exception was made by Bellamy. The writer, who could name his own royalties and live in wealth. Moore denied the citizens of Utopia the right to treat religion seriously enough to divide over it, but he retained the right for himself to die for conscience sake. He had not been inconsistent earlier in burning Protestants at the stake, nor in defending the practice. His unitary state, England, failed him in that the monarch used the unitary powers for his own ends. Earlier, Moore had warned a devoutly Catholic Henry VIII from too great an obedience to the Pope, but 
he could not prevent Henry from following his royal will. Henry, the great hope of Renaissance scholars, was, for better or worse, his own man. Oh, this is coming close to home, let me tell you. British royal family, public schools, subjection, the church. Wow, this is hot stuff, man. Wow. Thank you for tuning in to the Booth of Truth. I wasn't expecting such enormous truth bombs, but there you go. Wow, please do join me. Um, I'm going to have a cup of tea now. Maybe a bit early for a cup of tea, I don't know. But, um, nah, pretty too early, don't be silly. Um, so, yeah, if you want to support this work, if you believe that this is represents good teaching, um, then do consider giving, giving a like, share, comments, and giving financially to help me do more, better. Like, um, the problem is, I mean, I've invested in good equipment, you know, but... As you might have heard earlier, I'm still having some problems with it. So training as well, that helps. So, or if you just want to give me something, that'd be great. So uh, God bless you and hope to see you soon. Ah.